Well, hi, Marcus. Hey, Jerusalem. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. We made it to a new year. We did. I feel like it's been a long time since we had, had the opportunity to sit together and talk like this. So it's good to see yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> I know people have been joking that January was like a whole year. <laughs> <laughs> It just, it's, yeah, it's time. What does time even mean? I don't even have, I have no clue, no conception about what time means anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> I have never been so thankful for the liturgical calendar as I am right now. Yeah. Because I promise it's the only thing that's given me any sense of time and yeah. any kind of like excitement. Because there's all these, even like the littlest feast day, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> it's something different. <laughs> well, I've, and I, I was um, there was a presentation at Forma that talked about fasting, and I've just been thinking a lot about um, fasting and feasting and stuff like that. And so I've been thinking about like we have these feast days, we should use the feast days to actually feast and celebrate. So yeah, the liturgical yeah. calendar is my only conception of time right now. <laughs> right. Yes. It is deeply rooted, for yeah. sure. <laughs> Awesome. Well, tell me something good. What's going on? Yeah, I, so I promise, like, the presiding bishop did not pay me to say this. Okay. Um, but my good thing is this book. He did not pay me to say this. Um, I am not getting a kickback. Um, although if he wants to send a love gift my way, I will happily receive. Um, but it is my good thing for a lot of reasons. One, it's just a good book. It's just a good book right now. It's very, it's very sort of timely. Um, but it's another reason why it's my good thing, and probably the reason, is because we are doing a book club as a small group at our church. And we've been kind of building this ministry for a couple of months and we've been trying on different books. And the book's conversations have always gone really well. Um, but we started this one last week and the conversation was off the charts, exciting. I mean, it was just like trying to get people to like, you know, be quiet so we could leave good, you know, like yeah, it yeah. was just so good. And people are raising so many good questions and saying so many great comments and making so many astute observations. And, you know, it was one of those, those times where like you, you know, the meeting is about to start on zoom after you've been on zoom all day and you're like, Oh, here we go. Another thing. And you're kind of dreading it because it's zoom and yet you leave it at 8 PM super yeah. energized. Wow. Like it, yeah, it's so good. Like that's my good thing right now is that book club and especially that book. It's so good, so timely, so appropriate. I just love it so much. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I need to call his publishers and be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what's your good thing? Oh, so my good thing is that, so of the day that we're recording this, um, it's the beginning of February and we were just able to announce that the evangelism and creation care offices, the Episcopal Church, we have hired a consultant, um, Brian Sellers Peterson, which some of our viewers might be familiar with, to be our Good News Garden consultant. Oh, great. Yeah. So he's going to like really shepherd that whole ministry because it's just like agrarian ministry is just like, I mean, it's always been there, but now. I think because of COVID, right? And just the like people getting back to their roots literally and mm -hmm. like um it just has really blossomed and continued to grow. And Phoebe Chatfield and I, who is kind of my partner over on the creation care side, just looked at each other in December and and just, you know, we're like, we've got to have help. Like, this is yeah. one of our full-time job. Like, this is, you know. Um, and so Brian had all year been faithfully just volunteering his time and mm -hmm. helping us grow, you know, the Agrarian Ministries Facebook page and mm -hmm. just helping us do anything. And so um, anyway, so yeah, so he's come on as a consultant for this Good News Gardens um, season. And we're just really excited about the wisdom he brings, the connections, the networks, like he's yeah. already this list of like all the people he wants to connect and, you know, seminaries and Episcopal schools and, you know, just, so I'm just super excited for that work. And, and also the way, you know, we were thinking through like all our various ministries um, at the church center, mm -hmm. and it touches like migration ministries, it touches ethnic ministry, yeah. it touches ecumenical ministry. There's, 
you know, Office of Government Relations. There's yeah. almost no ministry of the Episcopal Church that I can think of that does not in some way intersect with agrarian life, yeah. right? In some yeah. way, farm workers, you know, to government bills that have you know yeah. so um so we're just really i'm really excited to have him on board and shepherding and and being able to give his attention to that um, yeah 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 so that's my good thing yeah. well i think you and i have spoken in the past about my parish has a garden that they've had for like years like you know before anybody can really remember um and so i'm really excited because as a as a like a priest in a parish i'm excited to think about like how much more that ministry can grow because the capacity of this position will offer our church here. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited for that, yeah. Thank you. I'm yeah. Too. Well, I'm also excited about our guests today. So, yes. So yeah, our friends from All Saints in Atlanta. Um, so let's have them come on and join us and tell us some good news. Yes. Some good things they're doing. Hello. Hello, friends. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, guys. Good. All right. Well, let's. Um. So I just you're from All Saints Atlanta. Um. But you could be doing anything there. Um. I didn't give. We didn't give any specifics. So why don't we go around, and uh, we'll go in alphabetical order. So do the alphabet real quick in your head. Um. Andy gets <laughs> off because we know he gets to go first. <laughs> <But if> <laughs> Briefly introduce yourself and um, your name and, and your role um, at All Saints. Sure. Well, thanks for having us, guys. And uh, I would just say, too, I was also reading Bishop Curry's book, and it totally inspired me. And I love Community Garden, so I love that intro. Um, so my name is Andy Barnett. I'm Associate Rector for Worship and Adult Formation at All Saints. And it is a, a real joy and a privilege to collaborate with Kirk and Jocelyn on what we are calling the All Saints Emporium of Online Content for Worship <laughs> Formation <laughs> and other community needs. Um, we're having a really good time doing it and we're having a great time thinking of creative ways to engage our community across the internet. Hi everyone, it's good to be with you. My name is Jocelyn Cassida and I'm the Director of Digital Communications at All Saints and I work closely with Andy and Kirk and my colleague Lisa to produce our Sunday worship services as long as well as everything that we put mm -hmm. online. Um, and yeah, it is it is a lot, but it is wonderful. <laughs> and I'm Kirk Rich. I'm the director of music here. And more recently, I like to joke that I'm the manager of a virtual choir emporium. Uh, we've all kind of had to reinvent ourselves in the last year, but. Um, just grateful that I get to work with with wonderful people like Andy and Jocelyn and happy to be here with you all today. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks for being here. So I am super excited to hear you talk about what you what 2020 has taught you about worship, right? So like the Episcopal Church, we are people like in theory at least I hope, are people who worship. We worship God and that from that worship comes everything else that happens. And yet, like COVID, among all the things it has disrupted is our normal patterns of worship. So I wonder if you all can talk about um what the disruption has felt like and how what you've learned over 2020 um that you that's been really life-giving to your ministry. I love that question, Marcus. And I think it sort of calls to the question of what's what's essential about worship, right? Because there are so many things that are involved in it. And when it gets stripped down, sort of what, what conveys, what, what sort of travels across screens and what um, what maybe can, can slip aside. And, and I've always felt that you can, you can hold on to the best of our tradition you, and, and you can also expand the poetry and rhythm and harmony of the church without losing what's beautiful about what we've already received, right? And so you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And what I'm particularly excited about, and I would love to hear from Kirk and Jocelyn too, is the way we found to invite new people into our worship life in ways that feels really authentic and grounded in what it means to be Anglican and Episcopal. So, I mean, Kirk will go through the list. We've had so many guest instrumentalists, which you would have like never heard of in a normal service, like acoustic guitar playing like flamenco style music or like classical music. And it's just gorgeous, right? Or like the, the Hammond organ trio from Ebenezer Baptist Church, like Raphael Warnock's house band, right? Like, like amazing players that normally we wouldn't have because it would just be choir and organ, you know, um, and preachers and people leading prayers. And so I think 
for me, the biggest thing is like, it's been an incredible opportunity for us to expand our network and to be shaped and formed and influenced by our neighbors here in Atlanta. Yeah, and to add to that, we did not have any online worship before um, the pandemic. We were not live streaming, we were not doing anything like that. So we really had to learn how to translate our worship to an online context. And shout out to uh, Reverend Zach Nian's iPhone for, for getting us through the first couple services because um, we, you know, kind of like everybody else in the world, we were like, oh my goodness, what do we do now? Um, and we've kind of worked our way and figured out what works and what doesn't and, you know, that, that kind of thing until we have installed, you know, a, a professional system with cameras and, and all of that. And, you know, we worked closely to figure out what we needed, which angles we wanted to get, um, that kind of thing. And prioritizing, you know, really strong audio quality because, you know, when we do have live music in the church, you really want that to translate as well as it can online, um, because that is such an important part of worship, especially while we're apart. Um, and yeah, that has been quite the, you know, 180 from this time last year. When I think about where we were last March, I mean, it's just, we were really feeling our way kind of in the dark. And, um, you know, Jocelyn and I, all of us, we were just sort of learning as we go, you know. And um, I think so many of us feel like we've reinvented our job descriptions, um, but but it's produced, like Andy said, some amazing good fruit, you know. Um, we have some pretty rigid protocols here in this diocese and those are in place to keep us safe. Uh, we, we cannot have live singing in the room. Uh, so the, when we started doing live stream worship, we were trying to find a way to have interesting, compelling music um, that would fit within those protocols. And, and having these guest instrumentalists in the city, like Andy mentioned, some people that we probably never would have partnered with before, um, you know, things like Celtic Harp and Hammered Dulcimer, you know, these things don't produce aerosols. So I thought, well, they're on the safe list. So let's try it. And, you know, it turns out they sound really beautiful in our sanctuary. And um, we're really fortunate to have some parishioners who are talented musicians who stepped up and said, we want to help. We have a wonderful cellist, um, our music contractor for our Easter and, and uh, Christmas brass, which we can't have now. Uh, she's a wonderful percussionist. So she and her husband have come in and, and played marimba and vibraphone. And, you know, we sort of reimagined classics like Bach's Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring. We just kind of came up with a, an arrangement for organ, marimba, vibraphone, and harp. And it sounds ridiculous, but then it just sort of... It's really funny, but it sounds great. And and so that ended up being a prelude for our, our Christmas Eve lessons and carols. And so, so things that we never thought, uh, we never imagined ourselves doing, you know, ended up just being really cool. Um, so we've, we've just had to move our entire music ministry and our whole liturgical life onto, on, onto the internet. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. Um, so, you know, you can have all the technology in the world and the, the fanciest cameras and those sorts of things, um, which can be super helpful. But if you don't have the, I think the intentionality and the community, right, coming together behind those sorts of things, it'll fall flat. We all can tell when like the soul is not in something, right? Even if it's gorgeous, you can, you can tell when it's just performative. Um, so can y'all talk a little bit about um, the community building aspect, like you said that you've had people kind of come out of the woodwork in, in your congregation. Um, you have a virtual choir, which I imagine is lots of people involved, right? So how has um, the community building aspect been? How did you stay open to people offering their marimbas, <laughs> right? And not say, well, we've never done marimbas. We can't do marimbas. Um, that's just not what we do. We're Episcopalian. We don't do ham and organs, right? <laughs> like, um, can you talk a little bit about that, about that, that welcoming, basically that setting that table of all are welcome, um, even in this way and, and how that's worked. And any of y'all can just jump in and. Do you want to start, Andy, or shall I? Yeah, go ahead, Kirk. Um, you know, I, we started virtual choir, I think, just after Easter. And um, yeah, again, shout out to the Reverend Zach Nyane, who 
was sat down with me and said, you know, this is just kind of a quick and dirty way of doing it. It's not going to be professional, but it's a way to keep our staff singers engaged. And um, I think the first outing was actually we did something with the full choir. We did the Hallelujah Chorus for Easter. And, um, you know, using iMovie and Keynote and just free software. Um, and I think the thing that I was struck by was people really liked seeing their friends in the service. Um, one thing to play an archived recording, but it was much more meaningful for our parish to see people from the choir on the screen, to see their faces, to see them singing together. Um, and so that's that's really made a difference. And there are other churches that are, you know, no, nothing against what they're doing using archive recordings, but I'm just always getting feedback. You know, we really love seeing our friends. We love seeing the choir in their red robes. It's just one thing that feels a little more like being together. Um, and it's it's been a challenge. Um, we, we were able to partner with uh, a wonderful virtual choir editor in Houston, Ryan Rogers, and we really have it down to a science now, but getting everyone to learn how to use the software and the, the online platform for recording, you know, that was a, a learning curve for a lot of people. Um, and I, I was actually surprised that, especially some of my, my older members who would, wouldn't say they were tech savvy, um, I've got people in their 80s that learned how to do it pretty quickly. And um, I made house calls, you know, if people were comfortable with me coming, I said, you know, I miss you all, I wanna see you. And I would just sit with them while they recorded. And then one one of our former vestry members in the alpha section said, oh, this is easy. I'm going to teach my friend how to do this. And so then it was really empowering the lay people to, you know, I didn't have to go to everyone's house and sit through and teach them how to do this because they figured it out and they were helping each other. So And that was really rewarding. Yeah. I love that. And I want to really just lift up and appreciate you, Kirk, for, for being such a pastor to the choir, right? And like meeting them on Wednesdays and actually doing worship, right? As part of your rehearsals and just knowing how much they love and miss each other and how much that community has been so important to their lives in some cases for like 60 years. Right. Um, and Jerusalem, I love that question, right? Like what's, what's the shift between like performance and community? And it's so hard when it's online, right? Cause it literally feels like church TV. Um, I was talking about it with my wife on a run recently and she said, you know, actually conveying drama and emotion and story across the screen is a very lucrative industry. <laughs> There's a whole lot of folks in Hollywood and here in Atlanta too, that have figured out how to like tell story over the screen. Um, and church has not, and actually just like watching people do church on its own is, is not very compelling TV on its own. Right. And so like, it's boring. Right. So like, how do you, how do you make that shift of like really compellingly engaging like the skill of filmmaking and videography, but get it so that folks are also part of it when they're not in the room. And I know Jocelyn has some thoughts on that in terms of our engagement, but I think one thing that I found that I'm, I'm really pleased about, and I would say like, here's something good that like this will, this will inspire me and in our community and also folks listening is, you know, All Saints is a, is a really cool church with po folks who are smart and they like learning and they like teaching. And our Sunday school program, our adult formation program, has for a long time um, had a tradition of inviting, hey, you know what, Marcus is really smart about evangelism. Like, hey, come teach a class. And Jerusalem's really great about agrarian uh, community gardens, so come teach a, a class. And so we have these really amazing classes at nine o'clock before the 10 o'clock service. And because people are teaching and they're inviting their friends and there's like this really sort of bubbling up grassroots energy around those classes, there's a reason to like, you know, brush your teeth at least, or at least turn your camera off and sign in on Sundays at nine. And then it feeds into Sunday morning. And then I know Jocelyn has some thoughts on how we're engaging folks with the actual services. But I think like Sunday school going into church has actually been a really cool uh, sort of an on-ramp for worship. Yeah, so we're, we're really lucky in that our um, community really engages on our Facebook feed. And um, that was clear to me from pretty much the first time that we uh, live streamed to Facebook, I actually got pretty emotional watching everybody's prayers and comments come in. And um, kind of since then too, it's it's been great because our clergy get in the comments during the service too, because you know we can, we have one person on kind of in the chancel, you know, on camera, 
and everybody else is, you know, waiting in the wings to do it. And they're, you know, praying with people, saying hi. And it just really encourages that community in the comments, which, you know, some people might find distracting and we have, you know, another option for folks if they don't want the comments coming by. But I think a lot of people, you know, find that that is, a real source of community for them and a real reason to watch the service live with us because they will get to say hi to their friends. When somebody, you know, logs in and says, Hey, I'm new, you know, it's wonderful to see everybody's like, welcome, you know, and so excited to, to have you. And, you know, here's this thing and this other thing that we can invite you to. And um, so that's really wonderful. And I mean, a lot of that was really organic. Like I couldn't have you know, planned that better. Um, and and it, it has been, you know, really helpful and wonderful to have Kirk and the clergy and other staff members in the comments as well, you know, checking in on people and praying with them. Um, and I mean, I know, you know, different clergy have different boundaries around social media use, but it has just been a really, a really great, um, a really great way to connect with people. And I think there's something there too, because it's a mix of like lifting up people's prayers and offering literally like real time pastoral care in front of folks and also following up, you know, offline. And also there's this like really hilarious sort of like commentary on the liturgy, which you know everyone does at brunch anyways, but now they're doing it in front of everyone and it's amazing. It's like, Jerry, love the red jacket, you know, like Gretchen's reading, hooray, you know, like great, great choir selection, you know, like, and I just think that's hilarious and wonderful and we like join in on it too. It's really one of the things I think I like about what you all are sharing, right, is that, and I think, um, I, I think Andy, you said this, that, you know, there's there's one way of like, of putting a camera in front of what we normally do and expecting that to communicate our story. And I think we all have seen those and I'll speak for myself, but I do find those to be rather disengaging um, because so much of that experience for me really requires being in the room as that is happening to really sort of, you know, experience the fullness of that. But early on in the in the in the pandemic, as my own parish was working through these questions, um, I had the opportunity of listening to Todd Bolsinger sort of talk about this as an opportunity for adaptive change. Um, that a technical change is just like putting a camera in front of like you know three clergy people saying morning prayer and then letting letting that go out. But an adaptive change is actually saying how do we adapt to this current reality to, as you said, Andy, to convey our story across this new medium. And that requires learning new skills. And so as you sort of talked about like using iMovie, I was very triggered because I have been like all over iMovie this year. <laughs> like I knew, I knew nothing about iMovie in March of last year. And now I know everything about iMovie. Um, so it's really about like learning and constantly being in that learning space. And so like, as we think about whether it's like this summer or in the fall, like whatever the post pandemic reality is, as we think about that, I wonder if you can, if you all can share, what is it out of the, this experience that you will take back with you whenever we can gather in person in the ways that we are used to? Um, what is it that you've learned that you really just wanna carry forward with you when we do that again? I love that question too. Y'all are so fun to talk to. This is great. Um, so one of the things that we did, one of our exercises that we that we did at the beginning of this is we actually wrote purpose statements for like communications and music and worship. And um, partly because we were trying to figure out like what, if you boil it down, what's the essence? Like what's left, right? And we came up with the statement that our, our purpose is to gather, call, center, and send God's people into the world to show Jesus' story. And so if, if our goal is to do that in our worship, and, and, and we can do that both in person and, and online, like, I guess it's worth sort of checking ourselves, like, are we actually doing that, right? Like, are people actually invited? Are the people actually asked to come to a place that is set apart, but also that doesn't call them to culturally commute so much that they can't sort of figure out where they are, right? Like, how do we be, um, authentically and distinctively ourselves in a community that's full of Baptist churches, right? Um, and also like really extend the incredible hospitality that Jesus offers to us all, both liturgically and musically and, and in our space and really engage with folks. So I would say the, the biggest thing I would take from this is like, it's helped me get really clear on what our purpose is. And it's helped me try to think, you know, 
can, we can check ourselves against those metrics, right? We can, we can actually measure a lot of those things. And we can also just like check in with our hearts too, because you know when worship goes somewhere. Like I think Marcus, you were there for those closing former services, but they were extraordinary, you know? And, um, and we all felt that too. And like, we worked really hard on them and we're proud of them, but it's not about that. It's about like something happened in the room. Do you know what I mean? Like it wasn't a performance. It was like church, you know, it was amazing. I think one thing I would I would hope to, to to take moving forward when we're allowed to be in the room again, allowed to make music together again. Um, I think the first Sunday that we had a harpist playing in the room, I remember our rector coming in after the service and he said, this is just so beautiful. And I know it's not something we would normally do on a you know typical Sunday, you know, after Epiphany or whatever. And he said, you know, maybe this is something we could keep doing after we're allowed to come back. Is there a reason why we couldn't feature more of these amazing instrumentalists in the city, people who we've, we're starting to build relationships with. And then the other comment that's really stuck with me from our uh, MLK Sunday Facebook, you know, comment thread, uh, you know, we were able to have these amazing players in the room who otherwise would, they would have been at Ebenezer that Sunday, but because they pre-record there, they were able to be with us. And we had a quartet of singers from the Ebenezer choir w with our singers in, in the virtual choir, anthems and hymns. And, um, and someone commented in the thread, this is what healing looks and sounds like. And that was huge. And so I think that's something that's gonna stick with me moving forward. You know, how can we remain engaged with other churches who are doing the same kind of work that we're trying to do. Um, how, how can we learn from one another, people from different denominations and other traditions? Yeah, and I think the, the other big thing is, you know, online church is not gonna go away after this is over because, you know, people are now, we have folks who join us on Sundays who live in different places who are thrilled to be able to see us online because it's hard for them to get there on Sunday morning for, you know, a wide variety of reasons. and you know, just keeping it really accessible um, for folks and the, the fact that, um, you know, online church provides like a, a low risk way for somebody to visit us for the first time if, if coming to church is intimidating. And so I think, you know, maintaining that online welcoming presence um, and, you know, and having somebody in the comments to be there even, even when, you know, a lot of folks are in the room. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, online church is not going anywhere. And I think right now, everything that we're developing, like in my office, is is th has three components. It's three-pronged, right? Where um, all the new resources that we're working on have an assumption that you might use this completely digitally, completely in person, or in hybrid. And so there are modifications because we just know that now that's going to be reality um, moving forward. There are going to be people who do things a lot more digitally, period, um, because of who they're reaching. And a lot of hybrid things, especially for larger um, events, right? It might be a while before we can be in mass. Um, so that's great. So I don't know if y'all have heard this. This is a, I'm obsessed with this story now. It was like a two minute NPR segment about cows. Did anybody hear about the cows? Okay. I know. Of course I would hear about the cows. I mean, so random. It's so random that I'm in my car at all ever right now. Right. And to have the radio on and to hear this, but they did this study. You can look it up. I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, they did this study with cows in Belgium where they played um, like a canned pre-recorded, I, you know, pretty normal human voice giving the cows instructions or just, you know, giving, saying some things to cows. And then they had the voices live saying the same things to the cows. And what they noticed is the difference. When the, when the voices were canned, um, there were no adverse effects, but nothing changed, right? When the voices were live, the cows' uh, blood pressure went down, their heart rate went down, they preened, like they got all happy and were like doing things apparently cows do when they're super happy, like, um, and, and so the question was just posed, um, from that very small study, I think it was like 28 cows, right? It wasn't like thousands of cows. Um, but what can this tell us about how we engage with people right now and how we can engage online? And one of the things, 
um, what I love that y'all are offering and that I think a lot of us, it can, and I, I get it. Like I get that sometimes it's just easier to pre-record the whole service, right? Like, especially for a small one person, you know, one clergy person, <laughs> one organist situation. Sometimes that by vocational, that's going to be the way to do it. But by just having like live, a live person in the chat, in the comments, right? Anybody can do that. Even if you pre have to pre-record all of your service, just by having live engagement in the chat, I think makes a huge difference. Um, and frankly, that has been, so I came from an evangelical background um, and the kind of background where like you can bring your coffee in, right? <laughs> like you bring your coffee in. I mean, they had a coffee bar and you bring your coffee into the service and it's like a totally different vibe. Um, and then to be, you know, became an Episcopalian, which is exactly where I should be. But one of the things I have loved about online church is that I can talk during it. <laughs> right. And I can comment. There's a little bit more relaxation and you're able to have those conversations when something hits you immediately in a service or a sermon. I could turn to my husband and be like, okay right like or can you believe that or i love this song or let me go look this up right now um you know or having those conversations in the chat and so i wonder and maybe y'all can just kind of reflect a little bit on this about i feel like there's a different ownership that's beginning to happen of the entire service on the other side of the screen um, and how can we engage with people when we're back in the room with them? Are we going to give them opportunities to respond? Or are we going to give them the opportunity to say, I love that or preach or turn to your neighbor and what did you just hear, right? So um, because you guys have such a robust online chat, how can you imagine maybe that translating when you're in person again? How can that spirit of participation translate? And, may, and I'm just throwing this at you. So you've had no time to think about this question. So there's no wrong answers. Um, and maybe I just scared you a whole bunch. But um, <laughs> you're like, oh, no, they're all going to be talking during church now. But let's think about that, like creatively, right? Like, how can we have that? Um, we're, we've taken down that frozen chosen thing, you know? Right. Um, so I have so many thoughts. I love that. Uh, and that, that cow story reminds me, there's a book by Sherry Turkle called Alone Together. She's an MIT professor and she's studying basically the psychology of social media and what folks are craving and in some cases not getting through those interactions. So really cool question. Um, and we actually just had a meeting about that this morning, thinking about how, how we can just continue to build up engagement. So there's a reason for you to be there, right? And it, it comes from this theological commitment that liturgy, it actually means in the original Greek, the work of the people. It is not the work of the priest. It's not the work of the organist. It's the work of the people. That's why having an organist, your, your principal instrument is actually the congregation, right? And Kirk's so awesome at that. It's just, it's so fantastic to be part of. You know, I think about things like, you know, we pick these really cool anthems that have the congregation like join in in the middle of the anthem, which is so fun. They love doing that. Like, we had Win the Saints at one point. The congregation just, the, Kirk turns around and conduct, conducts the congregation singing Win the Saints, and they loved it, you know? Um, there's so many things you can do musically to get folks involved. And, you know, we were talking about maybe, you know, sermon notes for the confirmation students or having, like, discussion groups afterwards um, based on the text. And, you know, having having things in the room is certainly something to think about, too. We haven't we haven't done that before, but it's not to say that we can't. Um, but I think in general, like, you know, coming into this work previously, I was a teacher, and, and what we always said is the person doing the work is the person doing the learning. Or the person, like, you know, or in this case, doing the engagement, doing the transformation, right? So, like, you know, and in the conversations I've been inviting around worship and, and, and music is basically like, what's a daily spiritual practice you can take on that will allow these commitments of faith? to be internalized and allow God's transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit in each of our own lives. Um, Jocelyn, I just am so excited about the way you've been finding ways to like take the sort of large video of Sunday and take that into digestible sort of like on the go moments during the week. I think that's a really cool way to do that. Yeah, thanks Andy. So um, what Andy means by that is basically I take out all the music from the week and 
you know, repackage it and show it on our social media, you know, throughout the week um, to, you know, just kind of provide, if you miss the service, you get to enjoy the, one of the hymns or, you know, one of the instrumentalists in the church. Um, and I think that that's something that we'll definitely continue to do too, because I do think it provides that um, kind of longer term engagement during the week when people are maybe not thinking about church as much um, and and just get them excited. You know, we had the we had a guitarist last Sunday. What's going to be next Sunday? Um, and, and and you know, not to not to cheapen it or, or provide entertainment, but especially in this time where, you know, we are separate and we don't get to engage, we don't get to see each other. Um, music has been so powerful in kind of, you know, just helping us kind of get through different feelings and on the mix of emotion that this whole year has been. And um, that has been, you know, a real source of engagement for our community. And, you know, I, I could definitely see, like we were talking about, you know, how musically we might innovate when we're in person. Um, and then again, since we'll have that online component to be able to repackage that and share it throughout the week. Um, and, and I think, um, I mean, I know personally, and I don't want to speak for everyone in the world, but I'm going to be so excited when we're back in person that, I mean, it's going to be hard to be quiet. In church, you know? <laughs> so I think, I think if we can, um, you know, just kind of name that and, and kind of share that enthusiasm, like, I don't think, you know, many of us will take that for granted again. Um, but there will be some anxiety and, you know, trepidation about coming back, which is normal because, you know, we have been apart for so long. So I think, you know, it's a it's a great question and something that we should definitely um, be thinking about. Jerusalem, your question made me think of the reality that some people are still put up a sort of invisible wall between themselves and the clergy. Mm -hmm. And that actually a applies to the music director sometimes too. I think because, I mean, my, my predecessor here was here for 43 years and, and there was a lot of respect for, for the program that he built um, and a, a wonderful, very personable person. But sometimes people in the congregation just think that person is unapproachable. Um, and one thing that I've loved uh, during this time is that people can comment immediately on, oh, I, you know, I love this hymn. I'm so glad you all did a virtual choir of this hymn or this hymn was sung at my grandmother's funeral. I'm, this is, you know, I'm so emotional or that was really an exciting postlude. Um, and, you know, not everyone, but I have uh, one parishioner who will call me every Sunday and give me the whole line down of the service and what she liked and what she didn't like so much. And then I have this another wonderful parishioner, a retired English and theater professor who will send me an email just about every week. And we jokingly call it the weekly postmortem. And it's the same thing. It's like, I really liked this. I didn't like the sermon so much this week, but the one the week before was great. Um, I hate that hymn. Why do we have to do that? You know, and I love that. You know, I love that we, the people in this parish, they're not afraid to give you feedback. Um, and it's, it's never mean spirited, but I think it's anything we can do. Hopefully in this time, people will come back feeling more, able to sort of break down that wall and just say, hey, I want to go talk to the music director and tell him what I thought. <laughs> so. and, and we've also, go ahead, sorry. I was just saying ministers are people too. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> well, that's why, like, we've, we've really made a point because, you know, a lot of folks think they can't sing and a lot of folks heard it as kids, like, hey, you can't carry a tune in a bucket or whatever. And we've actually, like, explicitly said and written and, and made this, like, really clear, like, I promise you that you can, like God gave you a voice, right? And no one in the world has your voice and knows your people and has your connections. And if you don't sing, the world is poor for it. And I promise you that it's beautiful. And I promise you that we need it and God needs it and we're better for it. So like, please feel encouraged and invited to sing as a sacramental act, as, as a way of participating and joining in the doxology and the praise of God with the gathered community. Well, and the Bible says, make a joyful noise, not make a beautiful noise. <laughs> so It also says, let everything that has breath, right? Not those that can, right. <laughs> well, this has been wonderful. It's so exciting to hear you all talk about um, the wonderful work you all are doing. And I think to me, the innovation happening, the innovation I think that is rooted in our tradition, right? The adaptability of our tradition is good news. Because even you know before COVID, 
our tradition was was being forced to adapt, right? We were being forced to adapt. Um, COVID has just like, you know, put an exclamation point on that. It's really highlighted our need to adapt. Um, and at, you know, you all's success in innovating within our tradition, I think is good news for our church as we continue to navigate all the changes that we're, you know, facing before, during, after COVID, right? This is work that we're still gonna continue doing. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's, echoing what Marcus said, it's such good news that there are ways to adapt um, and to engage and just making that offering, I mean, you know, this is an evangelism show in its own way. And, and you are by offering that, mm -hmm. that, you can sing, that your story, you know, in evangelism, we talk a ton about story. That yeah. It's about listening to stories and sharing your own story. And to say that you bring your story to your expression through song. Mm -hmm. is huge, yeah. Right? Like, that I, I honestly never thought about that, that, that my personal life experience is part of my voice coming out. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a huge evangelistic moment. Um, and what a, t and a testimony, right. To the wider right. church of how to invite everyone in. Yeah. Uh, they say, you know, they say the theology we call in, in times of trouble is the theology that we've sung, you know? Yeah. And so I love what you're saying, Jerson, cause like we did this hymn project, right. And we're getting folks to like send in their favorite hymns and, and we basically are using those all the time. It's a great database, but more importantly, like people will say stories with those songs. Like this, this song was at my grandma's funeral. This song was my dad's favorite song. This song was what I sang to my kids when they were growing up. And the story that goes with that song is so mm -hmm. emotionally evocative and powerful. And then when you hear that song in worship, it takes you right there. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah, Episcopalians think they don't have testimonies, but they do. We shall do. We shall do. They start with the song, right? Yeah. Like, tell us a story about your favorite hymn or your favorite yeah. church song. Oh, that's great. This has been wonderful, y'all. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for all you're doing, too. Yeah. Thank you. We'll check in with you soon. Um, and best of luck to you as you go into Lent. Yeah, you too. Blessings, everyone. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Oh, so cool. Yeah. I the whole thing the the whole thing really about adapting our tradition is such good news. Like mm -hmm. because I think like oftentimes one of the things I've heard around the church, I don't hear it as much anymore, but I used to hear that there was this feeling that a lot of Episcopalians had that was really rooted in shame. And it was really around, you know, if we are if we want to, you know, invite people to be a part of us, we have to throw away the best parts of ourselves. Um and what I hear in what they're doing at All Saints is no, actually we can we can we can really distill what those best parts of ourselves are and find new ways to communicate those. Uh, and I think that is such a, a wonderful way of shifting from the shame posture in our church into this really this posture of of openness, this posture of excitement about the gospel being able to go forth in new ways. Yeah. And it's authentic, right? Yeah. Like when you come from that shame place, I mean, that's when people try to do things like, oh, we should do what this church over here is doing yeah. because, you know, we want, okay. Yeah. And it's not authentic and it doesn't work and it falls yeah. flat. And then you just feel defeated. Yeah. And then people put up walls and say, see, that's why we shouldn't do that. That's not yeah. us. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and it just, it blocks all that out. But I think what they talked about clarifying their purpose. Yeah. You know, because then you can always go back to that. Yeah. This is the thing we're doing, whether it's adaptive or whether yeah. it's traditional, yeah. is it communicating those things? Is right. it, you know, offering that transformation? Is it partnering with God in yeah. this new thing? And if it's not, right. whether it's ancient or, you know, trendy, yeah. right. let's not do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I just, uh, having a clarifying purpose I yeah. think really helps. So. And I feel like, yeah, I feel like we've talked about this before too, that like COVID really has given us the opportunity because it's a crisis to really clarify what are we really here for, right? Like right. the normal things we were doing, whether they were good, bad, or indifferent, we can't do them, right? And so like, what are we really here for? What is the thing without which we would cease to be? Right. Um, and I think we're, we're, one of the opportunities coming out of this is that we have been given the opportunity in this in this time of COVID to really, really discern 
what are, what are we here for? What is our purpose? Um, and so I really, I'm excited. I told my parish at our annual meeting, I'm excited to think about what ministry looks like in our context post COVID, because we really have used this opportunity to think about our purpose. Mm -hmm. We're coming up with a lot clearer of an understanding of ourselves because we have done the work during COVID to really clarify our sense of purpose. That's wonderful. That's yeah. amazing. What a gift. And yeah. to your community, that's going to be as well, as well as to your people. Um, you know, my spiritual director recently, um, she's not anti-evangelism, but she's definitely like, she challenges me, right? Yeah. She's like, because because of so many things, like don't use church language. And, and yeah. she's always giving me these things. And she said, she said, I wonder what people would say if, if the Episcopal church went away, whether it's mm -hmm. the Episcopal church or the one in my backyard, if mm -hmm. it went away, what would the world lose? What would yeah. my community lose? And so yeah. if you're having a hard time finding what exactly is our purpose, start yeah. with that question. Like yeah. imagine that your Episcopal church poof goes away. Where are the holes now? In yeah. the community, right. Yeah. And it might not be the holes you think there are until you kind of dig through all that and go, Oh, okay. But that can help us find our purpose. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So kind of go at it backwards, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Oh, so good, Marcus. Yeah. Good well, it's, it's good to be back on the screen with you. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, <laughs> I'll see you same place, same time. Absolutely. All right. Have a good week. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.